Steve-O. Do you know what hoist you're on? I take them all, like that one, this one. No, what hoist you're, the hoist that you're working on. Oh, the hoist I'm working on, I've got the wheel on a hoist. That's right. And we haven't done any workshop videos for a while, so I reckon we should do like a masterclass video on wheel aligning. Masterclass. That's it. I reckon we can do that. All right. I will get started on the info. You better finish this car and it's Thursday. Tomorrow's wheel aligning day. Guess what you're doing? Well, it's more electrical. <laughs> That's right. So as you heard, we're gonna do a wheel alignment video because uh, Y62 patrols are very dependent on getting a good wheel alignment. And it seems people bring them to us from all over the country just to get a wheel alignment. So we're gonna tell you all about it and tell you why there's problems getting it. What are the symptoms for getting a wheel alignment, how often you need to do it, uh, and some of the geometry things. Because when you lift these cars uh, to certain thresholds, you've got to do different components to make sure you can get wheel alignment. So, all right, I'm going to go and get some bits and pieces to show you and we'll talk about it. So first of all, it's fair to say um, Y62s are a bit special. Uh, I can't think of another car that is so um, crucial to have wheel alignments. Uh, you know, if you've got a live axle that goes like a beam axle straight across, um, you know, if you jack the car up or lower, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the tire doesn't change. Uh, but when you have an independent sprung vehicle, um, and you can, this is easy to point out, those DMW arms just there, uh, they're all moving on their own. Um, when uh, that can create like a wheel wobble, I suppose, um, most of the time you get wobbles in a Y62, it is related to um, a wheel alignment or tyres. Uh, so if you're experiencing like that wheel wobble that I'm talking about, and if you've had it before you'll know because it's a bit sketchy, basically flat out first to second gear, when it changes gear it should throw you forward. If it does anything else, left or right, means your wheel alignment's out. Um, or you can just eyeball it. Like now I've seen so many of them, like you look at this car because it's jacked up, um, you can see the top of the tyre is further out than the bottom of the tyre. So that's what they call positive camber and it's because it's jacked up and we're doing stuff to it. Um, the second one is tyre wear. So if your tyres are starting to feather like on the inside or the outside, it's probably something to do with either camber or toe. I've just described what um, camber is. Toe is like the wheel in and out. So if you look at your feet, <laughs> that's toe in, that's toe out like a pigeon toe, and the back wheels can do that as well, and the front wheels of course, but you'll notice the wheel wobble when the back wheels are doing it. All right, we found a car with the wheel off, which is quite handy at the moment, we're doing a spring lift on it. Um, so this arm, it's got bushes in here, bushes here, um, and it can be moved. So it doesn't just go up and down. This is actually like a bit of an arcuate motion for when you're accelerating. So we've got three arms that we talk about at the back. So this is our, our lower control arm rear. Um, this is our lower control arm rear, but at the front. And this is an upper control arm. And all of these things can move and have adjustment. Um, we'll talk about this a bit more in a moment. I've come back over to the dash side because this is where I've got parts where I can lay out and show you. Um, essentially, uh, we stock um, lower control arms, both the billet and the DMW ones. Um, oh, I get we're deep diving here. Why would we even want to change one of them? Well, I'll tell you. The factory arm um, in this area here, they've got a tendency to, to pinch and that bit lifts up. So if you've either got more than 300 kilos in the back of your car, or on the ball, you should probably consider one of these two options. Um, this one's been plated, as you can see all around here, uh, top, bottom, sides, everything. So that is a much stronger item. Um, I think you can go up to like 2,900 kilos on the rear axle with a pair of these. And this is the billet arms from OnTrack. Uh, same deal, they're indestructible and they've got, I think they're being reclassified now to actually match the same rating as the DMWs. So. Um, we did digress. Okay, what I want to talk about is the adjustments that you can get in these arms on a car. Um, so there is adjuster bolts. Um, you've got one for the rear arm and one for the front arm. And for the upper arm, I don't know if you can see it in there, the upper arm looks like this, but there isn't like a, an, an adjustment bolt for this. And I'll go into that in a bit more in a second. If I lay this out now, so I've got, 
my lower arm and the front arm here we don't really talk about because they never break but you can adjust them but with those um, wheel alignment adjustment bolts that's what that is that goes through um, and essentially what you can do is dial the whole bush one way or the other way and that makes artificially makes the arm either longer or shorter uh, you'll see in here uh, and go have a look at the back of your car as a comparison see the little notch down here it's not a bad idea to get a paint pen and just like mark it there and there so if your alignment ever does go out on the tracks you know where to put it back to because it does happen um, and these bolts don't live forever um, so I reckon you'd get I'm gonna make this up I'm gonna say 10 wheel alignments and these bolts crap out um, the little notch that's in there I don't know if you can see that that kind of just wears out because it gets adjusted all the time so this is another thing which isn't a silly idea to keep as a spare if you're going to put everything they're not that dear i don't think um again <laughs> we digress sorry so you can move this that way to make the arm longer or that way to make the arm shorter to get your wheel alignment to, to fix that camber problem that i was talking about um same with the front arm you can adjust that to make the front arm shorter or longer and that helps you with toe now the top one you kind of can't adjust with a camber bolt um, i'll show you how to do that so over here is the arm in question it's got bushes through here as well and you can see they're a rubber bush nothing beats a rubber bush by the way um, but you can push this bush out and put an offset bush into it. Um, so, in fact, to be honest, you can do that with all of these arms. Um, you'll see some people put an offset bush in here. Um, we, I must admit, our shop generally doesn't. Um, we tend to shorten um, the top arm by putting an offset bush in here. So this is the offset bushes that are available on the market. Two types. Just look at the metal bit at the moment see how this one's different so quite often you'll see this bush put in this arm and and you can you know shorten it by doing that or make it longer by doing that now that's all well and good but um the reason why we don't do it in our shop anyway and i'm not saying this is the wrong thing to do right or wrong but this is what we do we're concerned that that's a thinner edge than that and if that bush is moving all the time, that nolithane is going to wear out. Um, this bush, on the other hand, the nolithane is the same the whole way around, the same thickness, and the, the bush is actually offset like in the metal part, um, not into the, the nolithane part. And it's also got these like teeth in it. So when you tighten the bolt up, it like, you know, bites on that to stop it rotating. Um, so, and I think that will last longer than that. Um, so we just use them. Um, <laughs> these are hard to get. They only come from one supplier. These you can get quite easily. They're expensive, they're cheap, but yeah, like I said, anyone that comes through our shop is getting them if required. Um, and, oh, where do we fit them? Uh, we fit them in that arm, but again, your options are to put them in that arm. Now, well, when we talk about lift heights, I'm going to talk about the difference between these two arms as well, because that's when that comes into play. So as good as all these Nolithane bushes are, as I was saying, nothing beats a genuine Nissan rubber bush, um, because uh, after a while, the grease that's used in them can like sneak itself out and they can squeak if you give them a hard life. Um, so there is another way, and I've had to walk out the car park to my car, so I'll show you what I've done to my car. Oh, I can't get in there. Oh no. Aha. All right, whether you can see it there, that gold bit at the top. So I've got a on-track billet lower control arm and an on-track billet upper control arm. So that upper rear arm has been made shorter, meaning I can continue to use the factory bush and um, I'll never have any squeaks, so it's going to be as strong as you can get. Um, right, that's the back kind of discussed in a geometry sense. Let's go to the front. Let's go have a look at this car to see what we can learn about the front suspension. Alright, so we're doing um, diff drops and 
um, diff gears on this one. Uh, so, actually no, not diff gears, just diff drops. Anyway, this is the lower control arm. This is where it sits. <laughs> Wheel would go there if like uh, the other bits and pieces were there, but this allows us to have a look at what's going on So we've got a wheel alignment bolt and I've explained what they do now one here and one at the back And it's the same sort of movement. You can like twist this around and do all sorts of stuff um, We've got an upper control arm up here. So this is another way of changing the geometry of the car So let's go and see some of these parts on a bench <clears throat> Here we go. This is what the standard upper control arm looks like Give you a look to be honest there's no problem with strength at all with these they're fine bushes are fine um, you'll see that the ball joints missing I'll talk about that in a second however in a geometry sense there's you can get advantages in both camber and caster by changing this to an aftermarket jobby uh, like one of these so this is our own dash off-road uh, and you say, oh, that looks like a road safe one. Well, yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> we just get dash off-road put on the cap. Um, and as I was saying earlier, you can't beat a factory Nissan like rubber ball joint. So we actually press out, um, but you can use these, don't get me wrong. You can put them in your car, no problem at all. Um, but in our shop, we press the ball joint out of the factory arm. We press the road safe ball out of the upper, like aftermarket upper control arm and then we push it back in and you'll get 100,000 Ks, no problems and you don't have to worry about greasing them and all that other sort of stuff. And then of course, we've got to show you the bling. There's the on-track billet upper control arm um, that we've got as well. And I believe they've got a factory uh, ball joint in there as well. So you're never gonna have to worry about that either. So all of this is fixed. Uh, there's not adjustment that you can make in it, but there is a, like a programmed caster and camber addition to get the geometry right for when you lift the car. And I think that's a good segue to lifting patrols. All right, let's briefly talk about lifting these Y62s uh, that's relevant to geometry and um, wheel alignments, because that's another whole subject that I think I've covered before. But essentially there's two ways to lift one of these patrols. Uh, at the front, you either do it with a coil lift, um, which is like this one here, um, like that, uh, or you, you can do a lower control arm lift. Um, what is that you say? I'll show you on this stock one over here. This is the eye bolt, um, so the, the shock absorber goes up through there, the HBMC, and I'm saying that's, I don't know, maybe 40 mil from there to there. Um, this is the other way. So we sell these kits, but now we've got a much higher bracket here. So that eye bolt has been moved up um, and you can lift the car exactly two inches um, with that sort of lift at the front. At the rear, it's basically coils. Oh, by the way, you can do a coil lift and a lower car control arm lift and that's what's in my car at the moment and I've got about an 85 mil lift uh, but now at the back um, yeah basically it's just coils different types of coils this particular one's got Dobinson's you know we do old man emu tough dog we've got our own coils as well but um, and if you need to say you do a four inch lift at the front uh, actually it's not quite four inches, a bit under. Um, to match it at the back, you put a two inch coil in and then you can put a K-frame spacer in. I'll just put the light on, um, which goes in here. It's like doing a body lift, essentially, um, at the back to get it all to match. All right, I think this is gonna be the interesting part of the video now because there's con controversy here um, about, I've seen different shops talk about different things. So what I'm saying from here in is my opinion. So in my opinion, and every YouTuber knows that's the disclaimer so you can't get sued. Um, in my opinion, when you keep the lift at 40 millimeters or less, so we often achieve this with the tough dog coils, um, you don't really have to worry about geometry at the front. Um, you don't, like you can still achieve camber, um, you get a little bit less cast but it's not that bad, uh, you can get away with it, so you don't have to. Um, you will see some shops just doing up control arm on every single lift, uh, I don't think you have to, uh, unless uh, the GVM requirements insist on it. So there will be cars that will lift 40 mil, but in the recipe of the GVM upgrade, they say you have to do upper control arm, so we do it. Um, now, at the back, it's a little bit different. 
if you keep it to around that 40 mil, you probably don't even need camera correction bushes. Um, and here's, here's the rub. So when you put a fresh coil in the back, like we often use these Tough Dog 795s, if the car is dead empty, like there's nothing in it, or maybe the rear seat's removed, we can't achieve um, uh, camber. So we have to put the camber correction bushes because we don't want it leaving our shop with it. Even though it probably will settle or the customer will put weight in it, we can't get wheel alignment. It's, it's positive camber like this one here. It'll wobble and it might even cause an accident. So you have to put camber correction bushes in that one. If it's 40 mil or lower, so let's say the person's got as little as just like a fridge or a battery system in the back, we don't actually have to use them. Um, and the benefit of that is we don't have to worry about the wear, whatever I did with those bushes before. We don't have to worry about premature wear of the bush um, because it's got the rubber ones in and rubber is best or Nissan Genuine is best. So we only use them when we have to. Um, now, there is some other little cheats that you can do um, to get away with them. Like I said, the billet upper arms to shorten it and that's how you can um, get your cast to return there. And there's one other little sneaky way. Because of these um, billets, and you know they're like the originators of who makes billet arms, if you can see on track written on the side, because um, there are some copies out there, um, they are actually a little bit longer than um, the factory lower control arm. So you can sometimes get away with using billet arms and not have to use camber bushes either. Or if you've got a really big lift, like that, you know, close to four inch, uh, like my car, then I've got well, I've got the billet arms and I would have had to do camber bushes or I've got that billet upper too. So essentially what I'm saying, if you don't have to lift your car over 40 mil, don't. Um, if you want it for looks or it's not even for bigger tyres, you can fit 35s on without a lift. Um, so mainly it's for looks and you look cool in the car park. Um, that's when you go over that 40 mil, that's when you have to fix the geometry and you'll probably have to do um, diff drops as well. The, we often see just on a 50 mil lift the boots on the CVs starting to touch each other in the corrugations and um, we have to diff drop them otherwise they're going to be changing them every you know 10 20,000 k something like that um, they actually drive better at a 40 mil lift or less uh, they fall drive better if you ask me if it's not about clearance but it's about articulation um, so if, if you want to four inch lift and 37s like this this poser out here which is my car um sure it looks cool but it's not a better car um it's just for looks really all right if you've kept up with me this far you're doing well uh let's go around and see if steve has finished that electrical job and then we can start doing some practical we can get on this wheel liner Ooh, it's not looking good All right, ready for the wheel alignment part of the video now, Steve, you ready? Oh, hang on. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> we just got a couple of things to do first, while, isn't it? All right. I think wheel alignment part might be tomorrow, so I've seen other cool YouTubers do this. All right, it's action time. Should I be worried you're in front of a laptop? Yeah, it's not shut down yet. <laughs> it's all good. If Steve comes into my office when I'm working, like, the computer just dies, the instant it goes nearer. But uh, when I step out of his office, I say, you watch, it'll come back on. And he laughs his head <laughs> off, and I know that it'll come back on. <laughs> but he's, he's not bad at the wheel line of computer. I think it's still running Windows 95, but... Uh... <laughs> you just leave me on the tools and you all right, do that. That's all right. All right, as you're all setting up here, Steve, I'm gonna ask you some questions along the way, like, um, you know, this, our wheel aligner um, is right opposite our roller door here. Why didn't we put the wheel aligner, you know, around the corner on one of the other hoists, you know, on the wall? So it was something we suggested at the start. If you can drive in as straight as possible and not turn the car onto the wheel aligner hoist and have it all like sort of sit a bit, you know, uneven, the straighter you can go in, the straighter you can get onto a hoist, the best wheel alignment I reckon you're going to achieve. Yeah. And, um, like before, you didn't get to see the bit before the car goes on the hoist, um, but like we've just done suspension, it needs to settle and in a bit. So we go in the car park and do like little bunny hops, um, trying to get it to like get to the top and bottom of the uh, articulation. And then by the time it gets on here, it's not gonna drop. 
the tyre pressures. Yeah. Um, if you haven't put new tyres on and new rims, uh, you're relying on someone else to have the tyre pressures right. Just chuck them at 40 all around, then you know that the tyre pressures are not going to have one dropping and wheel on it till a dead tyre. So essentially, you know, there's there's no magic secret for a wheel aligning. If the car's got the right parts in it, the wheel aligning process is pretty simple. So as we do the wheel alignment, I'm just going to throw uh, almost like frequently asked questions at Steve and we'll just get his opinion on um, what we're doing about this wheel alignment. All right, it's about ready to go. Oh, so when they're doing a wheel alignment, um, you know, a wheel alignment isn't a dynamic thing, it's static. So whatever weight the car comes in, that's how we wheel align it. So we can get all the numbers right. Well, it must be, it's not like some of the shops you see where it goes in the green or yellow or red. Like we've just got our own numbers that we work to. Uh, and we only wheel align one type of car, so we kind of know what we're doing. Um, but if you bring the car in empty, we wheel align it, and then you go out and you fill up full of all of your stuff to go away on the weekend, the wheel alignment is going to change. I'll try and simulate that in a minute. All right, these are action shots now. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna fire some questions at you. You just keep doing your thing. Yeah. So I hear about this um, out on the pages and stuff. What is a tow and go? Oof. A tow and go is when you go and buy a set of tires and they just wanna give you a wheel alignment, take your money and just go, Send it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we don't do tow and goes in. So tow, tow and go is the, the only tow adjustment on these patrols is the front, obviously not the rear, and the front is the tow adjustment is that way. Yeah. And they just get the tow to sit right and make sure you're steering more straight. Yeah. But they don't even worry about car or camera. Yeah, okay then. So tow and go, if someone says they're gonna do a tow and go and they're gonna charge you 45 bucks, drive somewhere else. Done, all right. Thank you. Right, can we see the screen up there? What does it say? So, obviously the top left hand is uh, camber. Um, camber is where the wheel is situated, like positive camber, negative camber. The so patrols have a lot of issues with positive camber when you lift them. Um, but that's why we put the bushes in there. Um, use the on-track sort of uh, camber correction bushes to be able to get ourselves to a position where we can get some adjustment back by using these adjusters at the bottom. Yeah. So this main arm here is the one that does the um, camber, just due to the fact that it's bolted to the bottom of the axle there, and it's gonna give it a pivot point. So if I can get that camber uh, pretty much straight up and down, then I can start playing around with my toe, which is this toe arm here, yeah. is one with the spring on it. I reckon I said that back to front earlier in this video, so excuse that. That's all right. <laughs> so I'll give you some example. If I was to move this bolt one way or the other, going to change that top left hand number which is our camber. So it's saying positive 45 degrees at the moment. So I can change it and give it more positive Yeah. by going that way or I can go back the other way and get that so it's coming back down to zero. Yeah. So slow increments down, get it as close as we can to zero on the top left which is indicating to us our toe now is negative so our wheel's pointing. Yeah. Out the wrong around. way. So, as Dave was describing with these bolts, you can make the arm longer or shorter, depending on what way you go with these. Now, I'm going to try and make this arm longer so I can bring back the negative and get some positive. I don't think uh, peeps will be able to see the monitor here, but it's like coming back to zero basically. Alright. So, what we want to try and achieve is a little bit of positive. So positive 0 0.05 in tow is going to help direct this car down the road nicely. Now the cam, uh, the, the camber on the top left hand has changed, obviously because I've just made a huge um, adjustment on that tow arm. So just make a bit of a nip and make it so it comes back to zero. Yeah, we go around to the screen. So if I can get it back to zero, get that code sitting at positive, not negative. Yeah. 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 Alright, so there's our perfect number. 
that number there, if we can correspond that over to the right hand side and get the same numbers, we're going to have it perfectly symmetric back end, which is not going to give you any wobbles and no issues. Activity. First one done. So that bolt that you're swinging on there, the wheel alignment bolt. Yeah. How many wheel alignments do you reckon you can get out of one of those bolts before they start to crap out? Oh, look, it's a, uh, it's a fine line. I mean, you've got to do these things up pretty tight because when we're lifting them, we're putting things on more stress, uh, a bit more of an angle and standard sort of horizontal. Um, so, you know, going back to what you're saying, you're going to need a wheel aligner every six months. Uh, every time you service it, good idea just to get a wheel alignment because it's independent rear suspension. So I'd be no more than sort of 10 times. Yeah. After about the 10th time, it's probably a good idea to start replacing these bolts. For the price they are, just do it. I don't have an idea. And um, that was my other question. The rust, the rust gets in them. There's, there's multiple reasons. Like on, obviously the thread gets thrashed out. You've got a little cutout in the washer that goes in a, a little slot that chews up eventually. But not only that, the actual bolt itself going through the genuine bush rusts. Yeah. And, you, and once that rusts and it's part and parcel of the bush, it's near impossible. You have to cut this thing apart to get it out, which, trust me, you don't want to do. You don't want to build from your wheel liner either. So, would it be fair to say, you know, answering the question of how often you want to do a wheel alignment, would it be more so if you're changing the weight of the car or is it just a time thing? Oh, 100%. As soon as you go on, uh, you know, buy the best fridge you can possibly fit, the fridge slide, anything you put in the back of this car is going to alter the wheel alignments. I mean, I'm only a light bugger, but if I was to imagine I was a, a fridge and a drawer battery set up going in the back of the car, you watch these numbers. I know I'm halfway through a wheel alignment, but if I was to lean on it. All right, so, uh, so that's if I was to take weight away, lifting it up, change the numbers. Yeah. If I was to go and leave it down. Told you I'm only a lot, but they do change the numbers. So as soon as you add weight to the back of these cars, mm. it's a good idea to do a wheel alignment. Should have had a bigger lunch. If you lunch. do off-roading, it's a good idea to do a wheel alignment. Yeah. If you tow a lot, and then you're going to be, you know, say doing a, a lap, you want to get wheel alignment because your springs do compress and change. So, yeah, wheel alignment at the weight that you're at. 100%. If you're wheel aligning, if you're, if you're going away and you've put a heap of luggage and stuff that's going to be in the car for 6 to 12 months, it's a good idea to sort of get a ballpark figure of what's going to be in there weight wise so you can get a wheel alignment out of it. Gotcha. I've always said that you put the coils in to match the bolted mass and you put the airbags in to match the unbolted mass. So um, I guess if you are going to put seven people in the car or change the weight that's when you um, uh, start using your airbags to re return that height time to move to the front uh, just for reference this car we've done an on-track lift on it's got the upper control arms um, this is the numbers we're playing with to start with caster camber two all right what are we going to do here steve so obviously we got, um, because we put the lift in and we've uh, dropped that down 50 mil, it's made positive on the, um, on the wheel. So positive is that way. So I need to be able to use those bolts that we use for the wheel liner to be able to drag that lower control arm out, which will then fix up and clean up that camber. Um, and then I can muck around with then caster to get that wheel forward. People may or may not understand caster, but the more caster you have, the better fuel and return you get in your steering wheel. Caster axes work positive, so more forward. Positive caster gives you better fuel. Negative caster gives you like a real loose steering wheel and can be quite dangerous. I, you know, my non-mechanical mind, there's like the difference between driving like a, you know, a Harley Davidson where the front wheel's a long way forward compared to like a, my kid's Razor scooter. Like when you you have to put a lot more input into the scooter, it almost feels like you, uh, as uh, Andrew Cassis says, standing on your tippy toes. Um, whereas if you have got the front wheel a long way forward, um, uh, yeah, that's where it drives true and straight line. So there is adjustments here, and basically more is more.
You're not doing a toe and go, are you there, Steve? Yeah. It's a toe and go. <laughs> so that's that's how you adjust the toe then at the front. And then so what are these other bits here and here then? So when you go into those wheel liners that you've had your nice fresh, you know, five hundred odd or more tires on each corner and they say they're gonna give a toe and go, that's the only bit that they they change. They adjust that to make sure your steering wheel's straight. Mm -hmm. And they you drive out thinking, oh perfect. But as a matter of fact, you come back in six months' time and you've got feathered tyres and everything because they haven't adjusted these ones. What do they do? Caster. It makes your wheel go back and forth. And camber, when you, when you evenly do them both back and forth to get rid of the camber. Gotcha. Ready? Now, we drive uh, you know, on the left-hand side of the road. Um, there's a, you know, a, a, a camber as such to the road. Does that mean that we do the wheel alignment differently on the driver side to the passenger side? 100%. So I do a 0 0.50 lower um, reading on the right hand side than I do the left hand side. Mm. So as a matter of fact, if, if I'm driving down the road, I do caster going positive as much as I can on the left hand side. And then I'll just drop it down, you know, half maximum amount between numbers so that that wheel just sits back a little bit from this wheel and believe it or not it actually holds it on our cambered roads yeah i know this is for sure mm. so we're pretty much at the end of the wheel aligning part and this is what we are going to achieve on a day one just explain what we've done here so obviously this car was before was sitting at uh, caster of uh, four and a half five somewhere around there and we had a positive uh point zero uh, sorry positive 0.50 degrees. Now, obviously the, the tires are sitting out like this because we've lowered the car, uh, sorry, uh, lowered that lower control arm, which has lifted the car, but made the angle of the wheel wrong. Um, so what I'm trying to achieve here is getting the camber. Uh, I know I've still got a little bit of positive, but there is a reason for that. I'll explain in a sec. And the caster, I've set on the left hand, left hand front side at 3.55 degrees of caster. Which you'll then notice I've gone to uh, the right hand side and I've just dropped it down those few increments just to uh, make that wheel just sit back just that little bit and that's what I was explaining about holding on our cambered roads. It worked. Um, it was something I was taught as a, um, a youngster and I've continued to do it t today and I think that's the correct way to do it um, with the way the cars feel. If I set them up with 3.55 3.55, I tend to want to fall over with the road all the time. If I go to the right hand side of the road, I fall over. If I go to the left hand side of the road, I really fall into the curb. So I do like that setup. Um, camber is something that I'm gonna show you uh, exactly why I set it at POS 10, POS 5. You know, anywhere around that sort of mark is good. Just due to the fact that when you sit in the car, I wheel line these cars with no one sitting in the car. So it's dead empty. I don't go and just chuck, you know, 100 kilo weights or whatever in there because I don't want to do that. If I can set it up and understand how it works working on these things long enough, the driver's side is going to give you more weight, which is going to make it lower. And when we lower a patrol, it goes negative. When we raise it, it goes positive. So I've left it raised a little bit on the right hand side and the left hand side not as much. I'll show you by leaning on the car mm -hmm. uh, what it does to those numbers. Steve. No. I had a big lunch. Yeah, I did. <laughs> So me sitting in the car, we'll bring those numbers back down. So it starts to flick those numbers. Once I'm sitting in the car, it's gonna be more symmetric on the road. Everything's gonna be square. You're gonna be wearing nicely across the whole tire. You're not gonna be wearing on the edges or on the inside. It's gonna be the best result. And we can be pretty spot on doing this now on an on-track lift, just due to the fact that we're not changing the spring. The coil itself is uh, still the standard coil. It's been on the road long enough for it to bed in. Um, it's only the lower control arm. So what would this look like 500 k from now? So 500 k from now, the back is where we've got to go. Um, the back is the one that we've replaced the spring to get the, you know, whatever height we needed. Um, so that spring is going to bed in, which will go down 10, 15 mil, some, some cases 20 mil. Mm. And that's where we need to go back. And that's why we say to people, when you get your first wheel alignment, it's best to come back in about 500 to 1,000 k and get another wheel on it. Gotcha. All right. I reckon we need to do a quick road test just to explain that camber thing. Um, we'll talk through that. We've got one more thing too, Dave. Yeah. With the toe, 
Um, I've actually seen a lot of forums uh, of people saying they got uh, wobble. Ever since I've had my lift and my tyres and my everything, I've got a wobble at 100, 110. So what I've found with these is if you have it perfectly squared, it follows the ruts in the road. Um, when you go over a rough surface, it starts to give you that bounce, which goes through the steering column into the steering wheel. And you do, you get that wobble. What I've done is I can set it up at POS5, which gives you a total of 10 mil um, of positive, which, which turns your wheels in. So as you're driving down the road, it, it tries to track you in that right direction, which also eliminates some of that vibration you get. So if you've got a wheel that's sitting perfectly square, you get the vibrations up and it goes through the steering wheel. If you've set it at 10, it goes over a bump, gets vibrations and stops immediately. So it does eliminate some of that. If I was to set it at pos 10, so a total of 20 degrees, it can get a little bit feathery, it can be too much. So, but that does eliminate it. So if people are getting the wobbles, they could be sitting a little bit negative or straight, too, too, too square, which will make your tire last forever. But giving it a bit of positive just gets rid of all those little vibrations. Gotcha. Yeah. I must admit, I'm learning from this video too. All right, I need to round this out and go for a drive, I think. Sure. All right, we're up to the road test part, and this is where everything we did in theory on the wheel alignment hoist, we come out and see if it's happened in real life. And if you paid for a wheel alignment and you didn't, you were sitting in the waiting area and you didn't see them take the car out of the workshop, they just went straight to the car park, that's not a wheel alignment. You've got to test to make sure whatever you said you were going to do actually worked. All right, here's our road. This is what it looks like. And what do we do on this road, Steve? So I'm just sitting here at the moment and I'll stay on the left-hand side and I'll make sure that hands off, it doesn't go and take off to the left and smash into the parked cars which it didn't. That's a good idea. And if I was to sit in the middle of the road, I want to make sure that it stays nice and straight. I want to make sure that hands off, my car is pointing in the right direction. But I also want to go to the right hand side just quickly. Don't tell anyone. And I want to see that make sure that my caster setting is going to shoot my car to the right. So straight away, I'm going to the right. <laughs> so I'm putting the car to the left and it will slowly come back to the right. Can everyone see that? I can see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, hands back on the steering wheel. <laughs> Almost in the fence. So if I was to um, go back on that wheel alignment, as I was explaining how I set that caster, just back a little bit on the right-hand front, there's a reason for that, and it's to try and hold it up on our left-hand cambered road so it drives straighter. The car has to fall slowly to the left, just in case you do have a, um, you know, an a heart attack or fall asleep at the steering wheel is designed to fall away from traffic so you don't go head on. I still set it so it does that, but just minimise it so we can jump in these cars and just feel really comfortable driving with that slightly cambered. There you go, that's our wheel alignment video masterclass. I hope you made it this far in the video. Uh, we'll try and do more of these videos actually, so um, yeah, if you like this sort of thing, hit that subscribe like all that sort of gear and i'll try and create a playlist so if you're into like workshop sort of videos you can just go to the playlist and see what's coming up next all right see you next time on you on youtube yeah 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 <laughs>